like Pam said, um, I'm a current student. Um, hopefully I have one semester left and I'm done. <laughs> but we'll see. I like to take my time. You don't want to rush these things. Anyway, uh, I'm a senior manager at Union Pacific in Omaha. I manage a human factors team as part of user experience. Um, Ashley Banizak, who's actually going to do most of the talking today, is a usability engineer at Union Pacific. Uh, so we just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we have going on, a little bit about Union Pacific, and what we do as uh, usability engineers. So if you have any questions along the way, please just feel free to shout them out. So with that, what uh, was Ashley's background? Ashley's I can go background? ahead and tell you about my yeah, background. Um, I'm Ashley Manzak, I'm a usability engineer at Union Pacific. Uh, before I went to Union Pacific, I was a master's student at Missouri University of Science Technology and information uh, science and technology emphasizing human computer interaction. So yeah, I've got my, my grad degree. How many people are going for their PhD in here? You guys are braver than I. Um, <laughs> decided I wanted to get out there and, and apply it real quickly. So I do admire those going for their PhD. Who's going for the masters? All right, those are my people. So um, <laughs> who's going non-thesis? Thesis, anybody? Who's going thesis? These are all thesis. Students. All thesis, all right, well, good. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the company, talk a little bit about the IT department, and then finally, I'm sure most of you guys are here about usability at Union Pacific, which is what Slides are made. All right, so the Union Pacific, it's a 150-year-old company. We actually celebrated our 150th anniversary last year. And we span from Chicago all the way to the West Coast. And we've got about, it says, it's a little outdated, it says 44,000 people. We're up to about 46,000 people right now. And we span the whole the United States. Where IT is mainly located is in Omaha, Nebraska, and Austin, Texas. Most of the usability folks, we're pretty much all in Omaha, but we travel throughout the system doing a variety of different things. And we also have a subsidiary throughout the, the nation. So UP Hall is a variety of commodities. We're pretty well diversified, as you can kind of see in this pie chart here. So when coal was down, we were relying on our other part. When agriculture had drought, we were relying on our other commodities to kind of keep us strong. And we've, uh, if you've seen our stock price, we're at about $150 today per share. So we really focus on uh, diversification so we can keep our company strong and stable. The Union Pacific Center has about 4,100 employees in it. Uh, we've got a long list of commodities in there for those thinking about employment at Union Pacific, including our fitness center, training center, dining hall, uh, on-site doctor's clinic, all that other stuff. Um, one of the three things, or three things that we value at Union Pacific are productivity and efficiency, teamwork, which really leads into this diversity piece, and uh, high ethical standards. So with our diversity groups, you can see we have eight of them. Um, our brand new one are Vets and Bridges. Bridges actually is the one I started. And but we really do value diversity at Union Pacific. We really do rely on that teamwork aspect, especially within my team. Um, we're very collaborative. I'll go into that in a minute. So IT, these are kind of our, our mission statements and our goals in IT. Technical competence, camera and honesty, teamwork, continuous learning, personal accountability, risk taking, and demonstrated results. And so this is kind of the snapshot here kind of shows you a little bit about the different technology pieces within the railroad. Has anybody heard of PST, Positive Train Control? It's a government mandated program. We're spending how many billion dollars? Two? Many Three? Dollars. I don't know. <laughs> um, a couple billion dollars into it to develop this. Basically allows us to remote stop our trains, figure out that sort of thing. We've got, um, let's see, we're doing GPS systems. There's some uh, wheel technology allows us to take images of the wheel thermal images to see if they're running hot, so we make sure that we're not going to derail. A bunch of different pieces in the railroad. I remember when I first learned about Union Pacific, my thought was, what does a freight company have for me? Um, and we actually have quite a bit of technology in, in the company. So as far as our, our data center goes, we have 
a large data center within the building itself. <coughs> it doesn't say how many square feet it is in here. It does not. Um, it's the entire basement of the facility. We also have two disaster recovery sites. So for our Tier 1 and Tier 2 programs, we can fail those over in about five minutes. So we need to keep our trains moving. With our actual infrastructure underneath our track, we do have some fiber optic cable. And actually, we have so much fiber optic cable that if we were to go, um, we're actually one of the largest telecommunications privately held companies in the United States because we have so much fiber. And that's because we want to keep all that data moving. So in our storage center, we have 1.9 petabytes of storage. And so to kind of break that down, that's 1.9 quadrillion bytes. It's 190 times the data in the <laughs> Library of Congress, 12.6 billion photos on Facebook, 38 million four-door filing cabinets, cabinets filled with text, or 25 years of HD video. So we have lots of storage structure. All right. So let's actually talk about human factors and usability. This is my team. So as you can see on this little pie chart here, this is pretty much what we work around. User goals and business goals and where those intersect, where we can get the most value. Because I'm sure you guys have learned a lot about the user goals, figuring out what the user needs, figuring out what the user is trying to do, and who's working on you know, motivation and happiness? Anybody? Happiness? Who's working on interaction um, design? Mainly interaction design, okay. So we're not necessarily focusing on the happiness part. Um, that's more for shopping and that sort of thing where you feel good about the site you're on. Um, this, we're looking for how can we most productively um, have these users and quickly and productively have these users spell this information. Because everything that we do, for the most part, a lot of it's enterprise stuff. So it's not like they can say, I don't want to use your system, I'm going to go use the competitors because they're mandated to use our systems. But our goals are to make sure things are error-free, they can be entered productively and efficiently, and they can know what they're doing uh, with minimal training. So our main focus is to be the advocates for the users. We basically translate those technical needs um, and the user needs, and we kind of bring those together. <laughs> so that's what I just said there. Um, so we study the needs of end users in their work environment. And so this means a lot of different things. Um, how, how many of you guys have learned about contextual inquiries? A few of you. Um, contextual inquiries are basically where you go out to where the user is you, in the field. Um, and so in, that, in our case, that could be we're going to be with a yard master in a yard, in the tower above the yard, and we're watching them do their jobs. It could be that we're going on you know, the 11th floor to go see what our marketing people are doing. So in those contextual inquiries, you're observing those users and you're modeling their work behavior. So you're cap capturing a lot of different features, but basically what you're doing is you're, you're modeling the users in their work environments. And that helps us with the, the design phase. So another thing we do is we prototype and iterate on the designs that we're creating, from, generally from those user observations. So we do things like contextual inquiries, um, have you guys heard any survey techniques and questionnaires? How many of you guys are familiar with those? We do surveys and questionnaires, one-on-one uh, in, -on -one interviews. We sometimes do focus groups, generally not. And so those are our main um, techniques there. So when we're prototyping and iterating, how many guys use Balsamic? How many use Azure? Giraffle or whatever it's called. Omigraph. Omigraph, thank you. I'm like, <laughs> sounds delicious. Um, yeah, we use Balsamic here. We're thinking about Azure, so you know, if you if you are interested in with the company, we do get a variety of tools. Some people just like to do Photoshop or paper prototyping, but we have a lot of different tools. How many use more or Camtasia? Yeah, so we use a variety of different tools to do some prototyping and then some usability studies. So with the usability studies, once again, we go back out in the field, we bring our prototype with us, and we have a select list of tasks, and we have them go through with little to no direction. We just want to see how the website or the application did. How many of you guys have done some usability studies before? Have you read about them at least? Yeah. Um, that's pretty much my primary <coughs> focus in my undergraduate was that 
part, the, the usability studies part, because there's a lot of different techniques that you can use. And, our, and it really goes into that ROI, the return on investment. We're trying to avoid user frustration and costly re rework. Because we found out in the past that there are applications that you create, the user does not particularly like them, even though they're mandated to use them, they will find workarounds to your system, right? And so that's that user frustration piece. So you're not capturing the data you actually need to be capturing. They're not doing the work in the way that the work is most efficiently done. So they're working around the system. So we want to avoid that. We also want to avoid just blindly coding something, putting it out there, finding out it failed horribly, and then having to rework it. So. Let's talk a little bit about our design process. So I kind of mentioned that before. So we do the plan, do, check, adjust system. So we talked about the user research. And down here is kind of our who we in, um, invoke in this response. Um, so we've got the human factors team, developer. Sorry, I haven't had enough caffeine today. The business analyst and the user and our stakeholders. You actually see our stakeholders aren't listed on any of these because they're kind of developed throughout. Stakeholders, anybody know what a project stakeholder is? What would a project stakeholder be? It's someone who's paying you, right? <laughs> right, someone who basically is, is paying you or they are the driving force behind that idea. So. And also somebody who's going to get benefits from the Right. Project. Generally, yeah, so the stakeholder is going to get some sort of benefits. Generally, they're not the user, right? Although users would be a form of stakeholder. But when, when we're talking about those stakeholders, it's they're going to have 100 of their employees using this application. Absolutely, they're going to get some benefit from it. So they are guiding the process. They've got the money, so they speak the loudest, right? So we don't actually put them on here because they, do, they get enough talking as it is. As it is. So <laughs> you see, in the user research state, obviously we're using the user, using the business analysts. You guys know what business analysts do for the most part? Anybody know what a business analyst does? Go ahead. Kind of like uh, doing some uh, business related, like uh, either data analysis or some kind of you know, uh, project process analysis. Right, so yeah, they're doing a lot of, it's right in their name, analysts. They're doing a lot of data analysis. So they're, they're getting the business needs primarily. And they're also getting some of those user needs and those user requirements. But, um, so we work very in depth with these business analysts because they are kind of, they become the subject matter experts of that particular application. Whereas we're the usability experts in that particular application. So, so that's what the user research piece. The other design is pretty much the human factors team working on that, and we go back and forth between iterative design and usability testing. So we'll create a prototype, we might test it within the group, refine that, and then we might go get an SME, a subject matter expert, um, refine that, then we might go to actual users, test it, and then refine it further. So it's an iterative process that we wanna make sure that we're finding all the problems before we go into the actual coding part. So from that iterative design usability testing, we'd go into coding, and then ideally we would usability test it again just to make sure that it is up to par. And then we go into that monitor and support stage where we're getting feedback down the road. You know, they have an enhancement, something they'd like to add as far as features go, <coughs> and we would go back, add those, and we might do some more testing depending on how large that ad is. So that's kind of our process at Union Pacific. Let's talk a little bit about some of the projects we've done. I've picked projects that you can probably find out on your own. There's a lot of internal projects that we've done that I'm very proud of, but they're proprietary and I can't really share with you today, although I will talk a little bit about them. But with our public initiatives, like I said, last year we celebrated 150 years at the railroad. And so this is a pretty monumental achievement. Not many companies can say that. So we wanted to talk about the history of our railroad. So we made this uh, public initiative. These actually are links to three different other websites. The timeline of our history, stories, basically railroaders talking about their heritage and generations that have been in the railroad. And the Great Big Rolling Railroad contest was this video contest um, where they took our Great Big Rolling Railroad song and they remade it. So we had some like hip hop versions, some blues versions, some folk. I made a rap version. Don't look it up on YouTube, please God. And uh, I don't think it's out there. I think I took it down. But um, it's just trying to support the company, guys. But yeah, so we gave out, I think, what, $10,000 for the winner. So that was a good initiative. And so it's one of our public initiatives. 
Another thing, we work on our mobile applications. So the three main customers for our <coughs> mobile applications are rail fans, fans, so people who just really like railroads. How many, how many people really like railroads? It's OK, you can admit it. Yeah, a few, a few. Uh, some people get really, really psyched about the railroad. And so we like to be able to support that passion for the railroad. Um, so we have certain applications. We've got this UP steam application. We actually do have a running steam locomotive that travels throughout the country. And people like to know where it is so they can go by and take pictures. You can find some pretty hysterical YouTube uh, images. I know Tosh.0 had one of them of the guy who was just like freaking out as the train went by. He was so excited. Some people get really psyched for this stuff. So we do make stuff for some rail fans. Um, I think for this one we did mostly usability testing and I think a little bit of iterative design on that. One of our team members did. Uh, as far as customers, mainly what they're looking for is where's my freight? How much is, is it going to cost? Is there anything wrong with it? Um, so we have customer sites so they can trace their equipment, that sort of thing. And then employees. Employees, for the most part, they want to know, where's the train? When am I going to get on? Um, when am I going to get called? We're a 24-hour business, so they might get called at 3 in the morning. Hey, your train leaves at 0500. You need to be at this location. So they're constantly monitoring like crew boards to figure out where they are in the rotation. Okay, I'm fifth out, that means I'm probably going to get this train, which means I can probably sleep for another three hours, that sort of thing. So this really helps their um, work-life balance because they can kind of predict better uh, when they're going to get called for work. I will say before I move on that we do not work 24 by 7 as the usability specialist. There are very few usability emergencies. Quick, this button's not the right color. Like, we don't really have those all, all the time. Uh, so I've actually never been called, I don't think I've ever been on call for a usability emergency. So we have a little bit, I guess, of an advantage over there. Customer applications, so customer web applications. This is another thing, like, with customers, they want to be able to manage. I mean, it's part of their business. So this is the logistical piece. They want to figure out where their shipments are, when it's going to get there, how much they owe, are they... <coughs> Um, getting storage charges, meaning are they not picking up their freight and we're charging them because they're just leaving the rail car out there. Um, so that we have a bunch of different types of uh, information out here for them. This is a new site. It's actually not even live yet. Um, it was designed by one of our team members, Tom, who went to CMU, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, so he does a lot of this really neat customer application stuff. So. Um, I guess I might talk about a little bit about the internal stuff. I don't really have any internal slides for that. So is there any particular project you wanted me to bring up? I was going to talk a little bit about star map. No. Uh, does anybody have any questions? And yeah, I talk about a minute. Sorry, I did want to just say, so the reason that I'm here, I'm not actually part of the recruiting team that goes out. Ashley, that, which is why she gets a fancy shirt. And I don't <laughs> 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 But I, you know, I go to Iowa State right now. I did most of my undergrad work here. This is my beautiful daughter, by the way. She goes here now. She's not in the HCI program, unfortunately. But so this is really where my heart is, and um, so I wanted to make sure I had a chance to come out here and just let you know that um, I think what we have going on at Iowa State is something really great. Our team's very diverse. You know, Missouri S and T, Carnegie Mellon, great schools. But I think what we have here at Iowa State is something really special, and I want to bring more of that to Omaha and U Union Pacific. Um, so we just made an offer to uh, another cyclone, Hillary Davis. She just started in the program uh, last summer, this past summer. She's going to be joining our team soon, and I would love to expand the team even more and bring on more cyclones. So if you're interested at all in this, please just hit me up, hit Ashley up. Um, you know, we have a number of positions right now. We really want to expand the team. We have a lot of work going on, like Ashley said. We're involved in a lot of stuff. It's all really interesting stuff, we think. Yeah. Um, it is interesting. No, it's a big I, challenge at the railroad. I know when I started at the railroad, I thought, okay, you're just moving trains. Like, what's so hard about that? Um, it's actually probably the most complicated industry I've ever worked in. So it's never a dull moment. There's a lot going on. Um, and I would love to have more cyclones on the team. So does anybody have any questions? 
Anything I, you've ever just been dying to know about the railroad? Yeah. Any more about our process, usability testing, all that sort of thing? Uh, I'll even incentivize you. Got it. I've got things. Excuse me, sir. Pardon me. Grab some goodies here. I wanted to thank you for being so vocal earlier. I'll get you some sunglasses, sir. But I've got one more. Uh, yeah, we have sunglasses. Yeah, they're pretty sweet. Those are cool, though. I like those. <laughs> <laughs> right, you better ask a good question, I think. I got a question. Sure. <laughs> um, now, this is, he was saying that uh, to ask questions that we've all been dying to know about the sure. um, What do you guys do about quarters on the rail? About quarters on the world. That is not a usability emergency. So I've never been called in that particular situation. It is extremely dangerous, though. It's not something you want to have on the rail. It'll shoot out kind of like a bullet, and it could hurt any. You know, it could hurt animal or a person. Um, so it's generally not a good thing to do. But it's so cool. Yes. <laughs> but we're very safety focused. We are very safety focused. Seriously, that's uh, one of the things. Yeah, you do have to keep in mind. Don't do that. I'll, I don't think you deserve a water bottle for that. Um, if you promise to stay away from the Yeah, if you promise to be safe around trains, I'll give you this water bottle. I promise. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and take that to give a little safety message for you about trains. Remember, trains can't stop quickly. It takes us generally about a mile to stop. So if you are walking along the tracks or you're parking your car over the tracks to try to get the next stoplight, that sort of thing. Please don't do that. Um, one, it's illegal, and two, you could be killed. So one of the things we do like to let you know is trains are a lot quieter than you think they are. Now, the steam engines and that sort of thing, they were very loud, noisy things. Right now, we've got diesel and diesel electric. We've got hybrid trains. They're a lot quieter than they used to be. So actually, you might not hear the train until it's already come up on you or it's past you, because you generally hear it as it's passing. So just something to keep in mind, please stay off the tracks. Um, it's, it's no fun for any of us. We hit a number of cows on a daily basis. I mean, it's just they don't get off the tracks. So you can find videos on YouTube. For those customer applications, do you have this on the mobile um, website that you just the customer applications? Yeah. So those applications are mm. also on mobile. Right. So I mobile is really getting ramped up right now at the railroad. Um, we have a lot of mobile initiatives right now. Some of that is on the customer side. Most of our mobile initiatives, like the second image from the left there, it's <coughs> all internal. So we do a lot of work internally for our employees. Um, so on, for our customers, typically we are going to do stuff for them in the mobile space, but typically it's it's just not something they would use very often. Yeah, it's something that we've really been, it started as like, when we weren't involved in it, it started as a bunch of nasty grids, and so now we are cleaning a lot of things up and making new things. So, um, especially that train summary that we're, or not train summary, train lineup. Yeah? Did you do the whole process, the whole stages from taking the business to translate the technical language? Sure. Study and right. Generally, we, d we are not involved so much on the technical side, mm -hmm. so we'll generally hand our designs off to development teams, um, but then they'll come back to us for the testing. So really, we're kind of like internal consultants, meaning we get paid by the different application teams internally. I don't have a budget of my own, so I'm right. constantly drumming up business. They come to us and say, we're willing to spend this amount of money. Ideally, we like them to go through the whole process, but it's really up to them. Sometimes they just want usability testing. Sometimes they want us to go out into the field and gather user requirements. Sometimes they want us to take it through the whole life cycle. So it really just depends on the And that is a good team. point to bring up, how we're structured. So we are structured as internal consultants. Uh, we are not consultants, in fact, that we are employees of the, the company. But the way we're structured is we work on a variety of different projects. So Right now, I'm allocated 100% on a project, but in previous, I've been allocated 25 and 25 and 50 and a variety of different projects, depending on what the needs are. So some people might just need some usability testing done. Others start with us from the very beginning and move on through. Um, so it really depends on what they need. 
They'll come to us, they'll tell us what they're doing, where they are in the process, their timeline, that sort of thing. We'll write up a statement of work for them. How many have written up statements of work? Anybody done business stuff? Right, so I'll write up a statement of work for them, let them know basically our involvement, our deliverables, how much it's going to cost them, our timeline, that sort of thing. And we'll negotiate that with them to figure out what, what will best fit their needs, and then that's how we'll, we'll get on those projects. So we're very much structured like internal consultants. What that means is we don't just work with IT. We work with HR, we work with finance, Anybody we work all over the place. Anybody <laughs> who has it, exactly. So, so we're not just in IT. A lot is Okay, if I were to come to Union Pacific, are you going to make me write code? Are you going to turn me into a developer? And the answer is absolutely not. Some of us come from technical backgrounds. I was a developer for years. I can do that when I want to. It's up to us. So sometimes we'll create high fidelity prototypes um, in Angular or Spring MC. Um, but generally, nobody on the team's doing that or wants to do that, which is a really nice thing about working at the railroad and for for my team is we have a tremendous amount of freedom. We get to define this process. We get to define the techniques we use. If there was a new technique, a new tool, we can we can add that if we want to. It's really up to us. I do ask questions so far. Sunglasses, all right. Bright yellow, cyclones. So if, if you work in the usable testing and if you find something that is should be done in the business needs stage, mm -hmm. what do you do in this case? So what happens, that's a really good question. So the question is, if we're doing usability mm -hmm. testing and that's what the, we're getting paid to do and we find some big problem, but they're far enough down the line, then how do we how do we resolve that, right? That would be that's an ROI question. statement. So, so from basically what happens is we negotiate that with that yeah. team. If they're saying we just want usability testing, we find an issue, we point out those issues. Mm -hmm. we, we don't act as the police, we don't force them to change it. So generally what we're trying to do, and this is a big part of my job as the manager, is to get them to realize that's not ideal. Maybe next time, come to us earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. And we find that more and more, um, which is part of the dilemma we're in. As teams realize that more and more, and they, our services are more in demand, Right now, there's a team of six, including myself. We can't possibly support the entire enterprise. If we're, we're going, we're going to be at seven in October. We're going to be at seven in October, and I'd like to be at eight in November. Eight or nine or ten or eleven. But even if we doubled the team, we would still have more work than we can handle. I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of applications that are being developed right now, major initiatives. So that's another nice thing. We get to pick and choose what we want to work on. We might have ten teams come to us. We get to prioritize that. Yep. In almost all cases. Most cases. First yeah. question. What role does data and analytics play in usability? That's a good question. That's a really good question. That's and a fact, Brian there was question. a slide <laughs> earlier on the customer side. So we were involved in that design. And now anybody who's worked in the corporate world, you know, things get very political and people, everybody has an opinion. The marketing department's looking at this and they're saying, well, we don't like the icons, we want to <coughs> pop, whatever that means. If so, anyone ever tells you, I want something to pop, um, oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> those, those are, that's bad. Yeah. I, I don't know what I want, but I'll know when I see it. So you what we finally decided customer. to do is we're gonna just, we're gonna make those decisions based on data. Everybody has an opinion, we're going to our actual users and we're gonna figure out what to do. So we're putting together, uh, I wouldn't call it an experimental study, but we're putting together a study to gather some data so we can give that to the marketing department and they can make a decision based off that. We do um, sometimes, is anybody familiar with SUS, the System Usability Scale? So we, we run SUS, um, we'll do statistical analysis on other data that we gather internally. We, for example, we might run some survey, we might run SUS. Um, so it plays a part, again, it's up to us. We get to decide that. So if we want to go do some more research studies, we get to do that. Um, we've actually written several papers internally um, that we're trying to get published. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yes? I'm wondering, uh, roughly, what's the percentage of the suggestions or issues you uh, use the bandage to turn into the um, actual, I mean, your um, actions by the 
so let me make sure I understood what, okay. um, so what percentage of what we're recommending actually gets implemented? Yeah. Again, that's a really good question and it varies based on the application team. Some teams feel like they have to come to us because we're just gonna put a stamp on what they're doing. Um, the teams we enjoy working with and tend to work with really believe in our process and they will involve us up front. And in a lot of those cases, I would say it's close to 100%. Because we're doing the design, we're gathering the, the user research, we're creating a design and we're testing it, and then mm -hmm. we're handing it off, and they're just like, great, we're going to build what you tell us to build. Yeah, I just worked with one of our subsidiaries, and it was exactly like that. On my other team, it's more like I'd say 85%, and then some it gets lower than that. Those are the teams you don't generally enjoy working with, and those are the teams we generally say, we won't work with you again unless you change your ways. So kind of one of those things. It's a multi-tool. I have I a follow-up question. To sure. The question before was, sure. So when you are, when you get this sort of, like, I, w I don't know what I want, but I, I like something that pops. Right. Um, maybe, I mean, have you ever gone back and done something like an eye tracking study or something where this person then actually, so you know where this person looked, and so you know that person thinks of, let's see purple round things as yeah attractive well you could, I don't think we don't have eye, eye tracking. tracking I actually my undergraduate degree I did a, I was the lab manager at Missouri ST and we did have an eye tracker I wasn't a big fan of it because they're finicky and they give you way too much data but um, some people love to swim in it um, see, but I'm a data guy I would love to do that well see, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting a little bit into this and I I'm completely from the science side, so I'm thinking, I would like you said, this is right. finicky, and if you get it, you get some, some blobs of what this will tell you, and so on. But it's definitely a, you know, a step up from not knowing anything. Right? I, I, I will say, say yeah, and... I don't know what that means. At least now right. you can see, oh, they all look to the right side or something. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I would love to do more of it, and it's something, again, we have that option to do that. Right. I have no idea what that hardware costs. But it costs we, about... 13,000 generally yeah. for the software and then more the, than that? He's saying it's a lot more than that. Well, it depends. Well, it depends. We got the okay. total. I guess that was academic pricing, you're right. I haven't priced it for But all we have to do, if we wanted something like that, we just make a case of how we would actually use it, and the company's more than willing to support that, which is pretty cool. So we haven't done that. Um, well, we, we have at least two models around here. <laughs> so, student project is what you're saying? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure somebody. I mean, I, I only know this thing. But I'm sort of being the guy who gets the demos too. So yeah. I'm there yeah. and volunteer myself. I mean, there are people who, who can enjoy this. Stuff. Yeah. One of the things with the eye tracking software is I have noticed that it is very persuasive to stakeholders. <coughs> um, that's definitely the truth because if you're doing like click analysis and you're recording the screen and you see where the person is moving their mouse, a lot of times the person will be scanning all over the the screen and then they will decide where to move the mouse and they'll move their mouse. So people are saying, see, they're moving their mouse right toward it. That's not necessarily the case. They might be looking over here, down here, and over here, and then they finally find it over here. So it is very persuasive to stakeholders who are used to looking at like those click base and the recordings. Um, they can really see the user's pain, I will say. Put them in their shoes. Any very persuasive. Questions? Sure. Am I hearing that your company is placing more emphasis on human factors and usability than they have in the past? And how old is your um, usability area? How many years do you have? So the team, um, so it's kind of interesting. Our uh, CIO came from American Airlines. When he came over to Union Pacific, he said, I want a human factors team. So he's the one who started it. That was, I think, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a very different team 15 years ago, although I wasn't there, but I've heard stories, and we've evolved a lot. It used to be very um, standards-driven, very heavy-handed, and that's not the approach I want the team to take. So the company, we've worked really hard to expand that team to really get people to understand the benefits and to come to us voluntarily. And so in that sense, yes, the company is putting more emphasis on it, definitely. I think what you do is like information systems. Uh, the, uh, the background that I have is with information system. What we do is like we start from the business needs until the design, and we start even do coding, and that will start to. We teach this 
back home uh, in my country, in my college there. We teach information system and this is the system analysis and design. We start from the business needs and we end up with the design, even the code coding. So this is very interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, usability is one big measure in information system. So Ashley, how are the postings structured? I'm not sure I completely understand. We had some public postings. Oh, our job postings? Are they posted just at the school? I believe they're posted on your guys' internal uh, career site. That was, that was the impression I was given. So if anybody's interested and you go looking for it and you can't find it, please just hit me up. I have my right. cards with me. You can find me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, I, yeah, that would be great. Anything else? Yeah. Can you introduce a little bit about this human factors group? Like how many people or what are the background of these people? So there's six of us on the team right now. Uh, I manage the team, so I'm not really con an individual contributor. Um, I just create budgets and push paper around. <laughs> but uh, Ashley has to do all the hard work. But so yeah. Ashley, there's uh, so yeah, we're bringing in another person on from Iowa State in October. Our backgrounds are very varied. So I come from a development background. Um, we have some individuals on the team who came from Carnegie Mellon. They're very research focused. Um, we have a designer on the team. She has a design background. Um, I have an HMI. Very, what, so we also have an HMI. HMI, uh, human machine interface. She joined the team recently. Um, and I believe also anthropology is her two degrees. She's an anthropologist. Right. Very diverse backgrounds. We're not looking for you know a specific um, set skill set. Right. We really like that diversity. I like that diversity. And the reason we have we, so many different projects that we really can't have one specific focus. Right. And we work collaboratively a lot. So it's nice to have that, the, uh, you know, the other viewpoints. Um, so I could come in from a technical viewpoint and know if something's going to work or not technically, whereas somebody else might not have that same viewpoint. So, um, but generally, the way we, we divide up the work, sometimes we, uh, like Ashley, I might assign her a project. She just goes and does that project. Right. It might be anywhere from a week to two years. And she's working on that project. Um, she might pull other people from the team in to help her. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I'm just kind of rambling. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I can ramble longer. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes, sir. So do you find yourself, you know, the, this group has started as a human factors based group, and so I'm more user experience interested, and others, there's, there's some of a clash between. UX and human factors that on some levels, because your work is more internal, you don't necessarily not worried about the feel good, you know, factor. <clears throat> Would you find yourself moving more towards a user experience style group, you yeah, know, in the future? Yeah. Okay, because, we're pretty much uh, there right now. So. Depends what you mean by feel good. Well, okay. So <laughs> when our C when our CIO came over, he he was very specific. I want this group to be called Human Factors. Uh, so really, we're under a, a, a larger uh, group um, called user experience. And we call ourselves usability engineers. So like on my business card, it says manager user experience. <coughs> but we say human factors because that's what, we, what we're called internally. But definitely focus on the user experience. Definitely. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, is UP working with the biofuels industry to create new alternative fuels for trains? That is out yeah. of my jurisdiction. Good question. We do have an environmental management program. I'm not sure exactly everything that they do. Um, well, and this relates because I see there's a fuel surcharge rate and so on, mm -hmm. but it's all petroleum based. <clears throat> but right. given how closely UP works with agriculture and other related industries, right. And given that one problem that, that uh, biofuels has is the cost of transportation. Right. With the uh, biofuels, and especially um, fuels that burn like you know, oils and that sort of thing, uh, like food oils, we go through a lot of wilderness areas. And we don't really want to attract bears and stuff to the tracks. 
what's one problem? I have a story a really that I can tell off camera. Just, um, the bottom line is we don't know. We don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, I imagine there's some sort of usability study somehow. Uh, I mean, there are cruise ships that use palm oil, not around here. Yeah, that's. But there's a train line in India that uses tropical oil. Right. I'm sure we're probably doing something. I but really I, don't I don't know. have any. Right now, today, I know we're the second largest consumer of diesel fuel in the world. Next so, to the U.S. Navy? Correct. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. I would like to think that we're investigating alternatives, yeah. but I really right. don't know. That's a good point. It's a lot of fuel. Yeah, although one train can take 300 trucks off the road, and we can haul even more. That is true. So. And our building downtown in Omaha has won several awards for being very green. Right. Which we're proud of, but as far as the fuel, I don't, I'm not sure. So I'm guessing you guys have designed uh, some sort of applications that have a, a pretty critical safety factor in them. Yes. How does that change your designs and, and like how you go about design? You know, are you limited by certain things? Like you can't have this type of button. And these buttons have to be this color. Um, like how does that change the way you? Design? I can give you an example. So we have paperwork that the crews print out. They have to have those printed out. It has, if there's hazardous material on that train, it has to be in a certain format. We tried to change that format. That's actually mandated by the federal government. It has to be in a certain format. And there's a very good reason for that. It's consistent across all the major class one railroads. So if there was a, a derailment, let's say, and emergency crews came in and they had that paperwork, they need to know exactly where to look. Right, so that, those are the kinds of things we take into consideration. Safety, we joked about it a little bit, but safety is a huge thing for us at the railroad. It's always first and foremost. So um, a lot of times we're developing for people who are just sitting in an office, but it can, there can still be safety implications. If they enter the data wrong, it could cause a derailment. For example, they're dealing with wind blow over speed, let's say. So if they're going through an area of the country and there's high winds, depending on the car type, it can knock those trains over, right? So they have to be aware of that, and we, we do try to think about those sorts of things. How can we make sure that they're getting that correct? You know, if they're entering in a uh, blowover speed that's not correct for a certain part of the country, things like that. So we definitely take that into consideration. Such good questions. I yeah. hope you have a lot more swag in there. <laughs> I, I will. I will search. Start giving away. Oh, wait, you got more sunglasses. I don't get slides. True. What if I ask a question? Um, <laughs> then you give me a raise if I answer it well. How's that? <laughs> All right. Okay. Anybody have any other you, questions? Did I give you one? Yeah. There's a gentleman over here. It's you, right? Oh, no. There's someone else. Help me. My memory's bad right now. All right. Anyone else? All right, I've got pens. I'm always losing pens. I knew I was always losing pens to college too. So. You want a pen? Who's you? Yeah. All right. Anyone else? All right. Oh, yeah, that's right. He asked a question. Any other questions? Yeah. While Ashley's handing out swag. Swag. <laughs> So I don't remember the whole schedule. I know that uh, UP, there's some other people from UP here. There's a trailer where you can pretend to drive the train, which I always wanted to do. I just right, yeah, that'll be. It's actually right, yeah. uh, it's right up here, I think. I believe so, uh, yeah. Water tower. Mm -hmm. You'll see the trailer. In fact, we passed our colleagues on the way in. We were yeah. lost. See, some of you do like trains. You're just afraid to raise your hand. Go over and drive. I heard train. a bunch of sweets. I have a question. Yeah. Do you guys play Euro Train Simulator? It's like the number one simulator on Steam right now. No. <laughs> okay. No. That's really big. Train really? simulators are huge. Yeah. Ashley's a big gamer. Have you heard of this? I've um, I have not. We actually do have a Union Pacific one too that we. We didn't create it. It was, I think, PST. We yeah. actually, there was a company they made this simulation for to train, and they were going to turn it into a game. But anyway, Union Pacific was so impressed with it, we bought the company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool, though, and I'm guessing that's what they're showing in the trailer. Yeah. It's a surprise. All right, anyone else? Any other questions? For all the DLC. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to see such a good turnout.